بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. This video is about DNA's log gamma formulas. The real part of Z is greater than zero. The logarithm of gamma of Z is given by Z minus half times the natural logarithm of Z minus Z plus one half the natural logarithm of two pi. And then we have either that integral in the first expression or that integral in the second expression. Let's start by proving the first one. The integral from zero to infinity, one half e to the minus tz is one over two z. The integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus t minus e to the minus tz over t. Note that the integrand here can be written as an integral from one to z of e to the minus t u du. If we do this integration, we get t in the denominator. Then we get e to the minus one times t minus e to the minus z times t. Interchanging the order of integration, we do first the integral with respect to t, which gives us one over u. The integral with respect to u is log u. When we use the limits of integration, we get log z minus log one, which is log z. The natural logarithm of z can be written as the integral from zero to infinity, one over t, e to the minus t minus e to the minus tz. The third integral that is useful for us is the integral representation of the di gamma function, the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. Epsilon z is the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus t over t minus e to the minus z t over one minus e to the minus t. To obtain our first formula, start by epsilon z, replacing z by z plus one, subtract one over two z. In the integral, we have minus e to the minus t z divided by two. Subtract log z. So we have minus e to the minus t over t plus e to the minus t z over t. We take the third result after replacing z by z plus one. Then we subtract this integral and that integral. These two guys go away. From the remaining terms, we can take e to the minus t z as a common factor. Inside the bracket, we have one over t minus one half minus e to the minus t over one minus e to the minus t. Take this ratio, multiply upstairs and downstairs by e to the t. We get one over e to the t minus one. Now we integrate both sides with respect to z from one to x. On the left-hand side, we get log gamma x plus one minus log gamma of one plus one, which is gamma of two, which is one. So this logarithm is zero. Minus one half log x plus one half log one zero minus x log x minus x minus one log one. This term is zero. On the left-hand side, we get log gamma x plus one minus one half log x plus x minus one minus x log x. On the right-hand side, interchange the order of integration. We start with the integral with respect to z, which gives us one over t e to the minus t minus e to the minus t x. We have this result here. Gamma of x plus one is equal to x times gamma of x. So this logarithm can be written as log gamma of x plus log x. We can split this integral into two integrals. The negative of this bracket here times e to the minus x t over t minus the integral of the negative of this bracket times e to the minus t over t. This integral does not depend on x. Let's call it i. Combining these two terms, we get on the left-hand side log gamma of x minus log x times x minus one half plus x minus one. On the right-hand side, we have this integral which depends on x minus i, which is the same integral but with x equal to one. How can we evaluate this integral? We do so by evaluating it together with another integral in which the exponential here is e to the minus t times one half. Let's call this other integral j. If we use x equal to one half in this expression, this integral becomes j. And so on the right hand side, we get j minus i. On the left hand side, we get log gamma of one half plus one half minus one. That's minus one half. Gamma of one half is the square root of pi. So j minus i is one half log pi minus one half. Here is j minus i, the integral of i written using the dummy variable of integration u. Do the change of variables u equal to t over two. We get one half minus two over t plus one over e to the t over two minus one. du over u is dt over t. e to the minus u becomes e to the minus one half times t. Multiply the numerator and denominator of this ratio by e to the t over two plus one. Downstairs we get e to the t minus one. Upstairs we get e to the t over two plus one. Combine the integrals. We have the exponential over t. One half minus one half. That's zero. 
from here we have minus one over t from there we have two over t that's one over t then we have e to the t minus one one from here and minus e to the t over two minus one from there that's minus e to the t over two multiplied by the exponential g minus i is the integral from zero to infinity one over t times this bracket g is equal to g minus i which is this integral plus i these two terms come from g minus i and these three terms come from i let's combine these two terms in the numerator we get e to the minus t minus one take e to the minus t as a common factor upstairs we have one minus e to the t downstairs we have e to the t minus one this ratio is equal to minus one these two terms are equal to minus e to the minus t and we have this plus one half e to the minus t so we have minus one half times e to the minus t then this one over t here the remaining terms in this integral are e to the minus one half t over t squared minus e to the minus t over t squared what if we differentiate this quantity but with t in the denominator we get the difference between the two exponentials times the derivative of one over t which is minus one over t squared plus one over t upstairs we have e to the minus t minus half e to the minus t over two this part of the integrand is equal to minus the derivative plus this quantity here which i write as minus one half e to the minus t over two minus e to the minus t all divided by t let's not forget this minus half e to the minus t over t these two terms give us this integral we can carry out the integration of this part we get the limit of this quantity as t tends to zero minus the limit as t tends to infinity as t tends to infinity this goes to zero so we focus on the limit as t tends to zero we have a zero over zero situation we can apply L'Hopital's rule this limit is equal to the limit of the ratio of the first derivatives which is one in the denominator and e to the minus t minus half e to the minus t over two in the numerator if we put t equal to zero we get one minus one half so this limit is one half recall the result on the first page that the logarithm of z is equal to integral from zero to infinity e to the minus t minus e to the minus tz over t dt comparing this with our integral this term is equal to one half log one half therefore j is equal to one half plus one half log one half we know that j minus i is one half log pi minus one half then i is one minus one half log two pi we can now replace this by minus one plus one half log two pi minus one goes away with this minus one moving these two terms to the right hand side we get that log gamma of z if we replace x by z is z minus one half times log z minus z plus one half log two pi plus this integral here this is Binet's first expression. Let's try to understand more about this integral. Take the integrand without the exponential, call this function h of t. As t tends to infinity, h of t tends to zero. This is the first derivative of h of t. In the numerator, we have the function t squared plus four plus t, the hyperbolic sine of t minus four times the hyperbolic cosine of t. Take the numerator of this ratio without t squared. So we have these three terms. Let's write down the Taylor polynomial for this function of degree three. This polynomial is h tilde of zero plus the first derivative of h tilde at zero times t plus one half the second derivative of h tilde at zero times t squared plus one over six times t cubed times the third derivative of h tilde evaluated at zeta, where zeta is a number between zero and t. This is zero, this is zero, this is, zero, this is minus two, the third derivative is zeta, the hyperbolic cosine of zeta minus the hyperbolic sine of zeta. Is this positive or negative? If we compute the fourth derivative at t, it is t times the hyperbolic sine of t. This is zero when t is zero, otherwise this is strictly positive. The fourth derivative is positive when t is positive. This means that the third derivative is strictly increasing. At t equals zero, the third derivative is equal to zero. This means that the third derivative is strictly positive when t is positive. Our investigation has led us to the following conclusion. 
H tilde of T is equal to minus T squared plus this term here, which is greater than zero. Then H tilde of T plus T squared, which is this quantity, is positive. We are dividing by a positive quantity when T is positive, and then there is a minus sign. The first derivative of H of T is negative. H of T is a strictly decreasing function of T. What is the limit of H of T as T approaches zero from above? Using L'Hopital's rule, a couple of times we get that this limit is 1 over 12. The integral in the expression of log gamma is from 0 to infinity dt h of t e to the minus tz, where h of t is 1 over t, then this bracket. h of t starts at 1 over 12. h of t is strictly decreasing. It decays towards 0 as t approaches infinity. Put the integral on one side and the other term is on the other side. Take the magnitude of both sides, apply the triangle inequality. The magnitude of h of t is less than or equal to 1 over 12. e to the minus tz is e to the minus t, the real part of z, plus i, the imaginary part of z. The magnitude is e to the minus t times the real part of z. If we integrate with respect to t, we have this magnitude, our bounded by 1 over 12, the real part of z. The difference between log of gamma of z and z minus 1 half log z minus z plus 1 half log 2 pi, the difference between these two quantities tends to zero as the real part of z approaches infinity. In the second expression for the log gamma function, we have a different integral. It's an integral with the inverse tangent function. Our first step is to represent this inverse tangent function as an integral. Consider the function i of x integral from zero to infinity sine xt times e to the minus zt over t. Differentiate under the integral sign with respect to x, we get that di by dx is integral from zero to infinity, cosine xt e to the minus zt dt. Cosine is the real part of e to the i xt. So this integral is the real part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus t between brackets z plus i x. The integral converges if the real part of z is strictly positive. It is equal to one over z plus i x the real part of this quantity is z over z squared plus x squared. di by dx is z over z squared plus x squared. If we go here, if x is equal to 0, sine 0 is 0, so we have that i of 0 is equal to 0. We can integrate both sides from 0 to x. On the left-hand side, we get i of x minus i of 0, which is 0. This is equal to the integral from 0 to x of z divided by z squared plus u squared du. This integral is the inverse tangent of u over z. When u is 0, this is 0. When u is x, we get the inverse tangent of x over z. This is i of x, which is this integral here. This integral, omega of z, can be written as 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity. We have this e to the 2 pi x minus 1. The inverse tangent of x over z can be written as another integral from 0 to infinity dt of 1 over t sine xt times e to the minus zt. Assume we can interchange the order of integration we have first to evaluate the integral with respect to x. What is this integral? Multiply upstairs and downstairs by e to the minus 2 pi x. We get the ratio 1 over 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi x. This quantity is less than 1. We can use the expansion that 1 over 1 minus alpha is summation k from 0 to infinity, alpha to the k. In our case here, we have e to the minus 2 pi x k. Interchange the order of integration and infinite summation. We get this integral here, the sine function multiplied by exponential. Before doing the integration, change k to k minus 1. Our sum now is from 1 to infinity. This k plus 1 is a change to k. To evaluate the integral, we do something like above. Sine of x of t is the imaginary part of e to the i x t. So this integral is the imaginary part of e to the i x t times e to the minus 2 pi x k. The two exponentials can be combined as e to the minus x between brackets minus i t plus 2 pi k. The real part of this quantity is strictly positive because k starts from 1. This integral is finite. It is equal to 1 over 2 pi k minus i t. If we multiply by the complex conjugate, we get 4 pi squared k squared plus t squared downstairs. Upstairs, after taking the imaginary part, we have t. This integral here can be written as an infinite sum. k from 1 to infinity t divided by t squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. 
we started with omega of z, which is a single integral. We converted omega of z into a double integral by using this integral representation of the inverse tangent function. We swapped the integrals to do the integration first with respect to x. We got the result as a series. The good news is that this series has a closed form. Recall the product representation of the sine function. Sine x over x is the product k from 1 to infinity, 1 minus x squared over pi squared k squared. In this expression, replace x on the left and right hand sides by i x over 2. On the left hand side, we have sine i x over 2 divided by i x over 2. Sine i z is i times the hyperbolic sine of z. What we have here is i times the hyperbolic sine of x over 2 divided by i x over 2. i goes away with i. We have this ratio here on the left hand side. On the right hand side, when this x is replaced by i x over 2, x squared is replaced by minus x squared over 4. Minus with minus, we get a plus sign, and then we get this 4 here. Take the logarithm of both sides, the logarithm of the hyperbolic sign of x over 2 minus the logarithm of x over 2 is the summation of the logarithm of this bracket here. Differentiate both sides with respect to x. On the right-hand side, we get the summation. In the denominator, we get 1 plus x squared over 4 pi squared k squared. By the chain rule, we have in the numerator 2x divided by 4 pi squared k squared. So we have 2x divided by x squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. When we differentiate this function, we get minus 1 over x plus 1 half the hyperbolic cotangent of x over 2. Now compare this summation and what we have in our problem. It is exactly the same sum, but is multiplied by 2 here. This means that this summation is one-fourth the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2 minus 1 over 2t. We take this and insert it in the integral. Omega of z, which is 2, the integral from 0 to infinity, the arctangent of t over z divided by e to the 2 pi t minus 1. Omega of z is 2 times this integral here. Differentiate both sides with respect to z. If we differentiate this side with respect to z, we have integral from 0 to infinity minus t, e to the minus zt over t. Using this 2 here, we have inside the bracket 1 half times the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2 minus 1 over t. This minus sign here can be used to change the order in the bracket. The first derivative of omega with respect to z is the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus zt, 1 over t minus 1 half the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2. Let's write this explicitly as e to the t over 2 plus e to the minus t over 2 divided by e to the t over 2 minus e to the minus t over 2. Multiply upstairs and downstairs by e to the minus t over 2. This ratio is equal to 1 plus e to the minus t divided by 1 minus e to the minus t. The first derivative of omega is integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus zt divided by t minus, in the denominator we have 2 times 1 minus e to the minus t. Upstairs we have e to the minus zt between brackets 1 plus e to the minus t. We manipulate both parts as follows. In this part, we add and subtract e to the minus t. We also add and subtract e to the minus t inside this bracket. Now we have 1 minus e to the minus t plus 2 times e to the minus t. We split this integral into three integrals. 1 minus e to the minus t over 1 minus e to the minus t, that's 1. So we have an integral minus 1 half integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus zt e to the minus t over t is here. This 2 goes away with that 2. We have e to the minus z plus 1t. Downstairs, we have 1 minus e to the minus t. Here are the two remaining terms with their signs reversed. So we need a minus sign here. What is the point? This integral here is exactly the integral representation of the digamma function. Specifically, this integral is epsi of z plus 1. The second integral is straightforward. We get minus 1 over 2z. And this integral is like that one on the first page. With the minus sign, this is minus log z. The derivative of omega with respect to z is the digamma function of z plus 1 minus 1 over 2z minus log z. Integrate both sides. Omega of z on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we get log gamma of z plus 1 minus 1 half log z minus z log z plus z, then the integration constant. Gamma z plus 1 is equal to z gamma of z. 
So this is log gamma of z plus log z. These two guys give one half log z. What is c? To obtain c, let's make use of our previous result. The first expression for log gamma. Note that if z is real, then the argument of this arctangent function is real. We have an inequality that if alpha is a positive real number, then the inverse tangent of alpha is less than alpha. One way to see this is that the inverse tangent of alpha is the integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 from 0 to alpha. The integrand here is 1 over x squared plus 1. This is strictly less than 1. This integral is strictly less than the integral of 1 from 0 to alpha, that's alpha. So if z is real, this is strictly less than x over z. When z is real, this side is upper bounded by 2 over z, the integral from 0 to infinity, x over e to the 2 by x minus 1 dx. This integral is finite. This side goes to 0 as z tends to infinity through real values. On page 4, we have the result that the log gamma function minus z minus 1 half log z plus z minus 1 half log 2 pi, this quantity converges to 0 as the real part of z tends to infinity. This means that the constant c is minus 1 half log 2 pi. Therefore, log gamma of z is equal to z minus 1 half log z minus z plus 1 half log 2 pi plus omega of z. That's the second representation of the log gamma function.